At first glance, George Crumb's music can be very intimidating for the performer. Right as you open up the piece, you're hit with this wall of instructions about all these unusual techniques you're going to have to do and how they're notated in the score. For the first week or so of learning a piece like this, it can feel more like you're assembling furniture than playing music. Suddenly, logistics play an important role, and with all these techniques you probably haven't tried before, it can feel like you're learning a new language. The sheer choreography involved in playing a piece with this many extended techniques is not to be underestimated. You don't want to be flailing around looking for the right string instead of thinking about your sound or your phrasing. But once you pass that first hurdle of actually figuring everything out, you start unlocking the sound world he's making, this profound world of color and sound and timbres you never thought possible. It starts to open up to you and you feel yourself wanting to peel away at its layers deeper and deeper, honing every technique and developing a choreography for mastering the logistics of playing the piece to prevent any interruption or hiccup, however small, from spoiling the magical environment that Crumb has crafted. I am far from an expert in extended techniques, but a little experience and understanding goes a long way. It's sad that so many pianists don't venture inside the piano. When I first heard some of this stuff, it made me realize we only use a fraction of what the instrument is really capable of. It opens up a library of new sounds for the player. Plucking the string with the fingertip, or with the nail. Muting before the hammers. Muting after the hammers. Creates a harmonic. Glissing before the hammers. Glissing after the hammers. Across the strings with fingertips. With fingernails. Knocking the frame. Tickling the tuning pins. You could go to the bass strings, which have more grit. A little faster. Other direction. You can glide across these. Or you can just whack it. You can use tools like a guitar slide. If you want a more percussive, metallic sound out of the instrument without preparing the piano with nails or screws or other items that might damage it, a lot of people use blue tack on the strings, which you can find at most hardware stores. You can use a Super Bowl mallet for this eerie sound, it sounds like a crying whale or something. You can use a bowl. What bothers me is when a composer asks for seemingly random items to be placed on the strings just because they can, when it's clear they don't really know what sound they actually want. Several times I've been asked to place a book on the strings. Okay, books are different sizes, so what kind of book are we talking about? The density actually does matter. Thicker book's gonna be more muted with less pitch. Extended techniques should be a means toward evoking an imaginative sound world from the array of timbres in the instrument's toolbox, and for that we return to Crumb. A Little Sweet for Christmas opens with these mysterious whole tone chords met in stark relief by rejoicing bells. This is how you establish atmosphere and tone in a piece. Right away, we get these dramatic extremes that span the whole dynamic range of the instrument, and the listener gets the same feeling the performer does when they open up his handwritten scores. This is not your ordinary piece. Open your ears and put the cell phone away because this piece requires your full attention. And just when you're getting comfortable, he hits you with these terrifying bass harmonics that seem to come out of actual hell, and you're reminded in a flash that this piece is inspired by Giotto's nativity frescoes. There is a cosmic balance to everything Crumb writes. Sharp attacks are countered by soft, angelic melodies. Low rumbles are pierced by high trumpet calls.
It's like he's evoking the forces of heaven, hell, and earth to paint some mystical religious narrative that raises only questions and hardly any answers. Crumb's world is vivid because the techniques are specific. To start the nativity dance, he has you silently hold down this cluster and use the middle pedal so the resonance of these low notes will make a vibrating hum throughout the movement. To me, this movement feels a lot like Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. It might not be a coincidence that when you add up these pounding chords from the first page, they equal exactly 11, reminiscent of the famous 11-4 bar from Stravinsky's work. Stuff like this makes you start wondering about other Easter eggs, like maybe the seven of these chords in the first phrase of the piece signify the seven trumpets from the Book of Revelations, emphasized more clearly just a bar later. The level of detail and care that Crumb put into this work makes it a profound musical mural worthy of any artist's approval. But somehow, even with such a grandiose topic for its inspiration, it comes off as this humble little set of offerings. Crumb finds what he wants to say with the comprehensive techniques he has at his disposal and says it without a bit of extravagance. These small poems live in a genuine philosophical space. They are an invitation to listen and imagine.